This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so before we continue with Shabbos, guys, and we should be finishing with Shabbos very soon, I think the next topic, I'll, let, me, let me look, let, 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 I'll look over the curriculum. But I think the next topic will be Kashrut. I think that's a good, nice. a good, um, big topic to go through. Good. Yeah. Okay, so before we even get to Shabbos, though, let's do a little, uh, a little current events. Okay, what is this Shabbos going to be? It's oh, it's going to be Shabbos Kodesh, the Holy Sabbath. Absolutely, <laughs> all in favor of that. Good, Rosh Chodesh Elul. Good, is that what you said? Yeah. All right, nice. Okay, so we're starting the month of Elul. Okay, uh, there's a two-day Rosh Chodesh. That seems a little bit strange, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, Rosh Chodesh means the first of the month. How do you have a two-day Rosh Chodesh? Good. Okay. A lunar month is 29.5 days. Something like that. Okay? So we have six 30-day months and six 29-day months. Day 30 is always Rosh Chodesh. Since day 30 could be Rosh Chodesh, day 30 is always treated as Rosh Chodesh. If it's a 29, if the previous month was 29 days, then day 30 is in fact day one of the next month. If the previous month was a 20, was a 30 day month, day 30 is treated as Rosh Chodesh, as is day 31, which is the first of the month. Okay. The reason for that, um, they wouldn't know if it was Rosh Chodesh until the next day when the witnesses would come, right? The Rosh Chodesh, the new month, was determined by witnesses having seen the month, the, the moon reappear. So day 30 would always be treated as Rosh Chodesh because maybe the witnesses will come the next day. And day, right, if the witnesses came, it's not day 30, it's day one. We're good to go. If the witnesses don't come, we already treated it as Rosh Chodesh. But the next day, de facto, day 31 will be Rosh Chodesh. Meaning, if it's a cloudy month, we don't have, to have, we don't have a 40-day month, right? It's either going to be day 30, we Rosh Chodesh, because we saw the new moon. And if we don't, Automatically, day 31 will be Rosh Chodesh, will be day one. Okay. But more importantly, it is Rosh Chodesh Elo, the start of the month of Elo. Historically, what is the significance? Hi, Susie, good to see you. And Simone. Historically, hello, Victor. Historically, what is the significance of Rosh Chodesh Elo? Yes, it's leading into the days of awe, but historically, what is the significance of Rosh Chodesh Elo? Gabriella, we stumped you. I haven't got it. I've never read oh, boy. <laughs> Wasn't it when Moshe came down oh. from the 40 days up north, up in the mountain? Okay, you're on the right track, but the wrong direction. Oh. That's Moshe went back up. Oh, yes, thank you. Meaning, Moshe had come down and seen the golden calf and broke the tablets. That was on the fast day that we had about 40 day, a little less than 40 days ago. That was the 17th day of Tom. Moshe came down, saw the golden calf, broke the tablets. 40 days later is when Moshe, through his supplication, got the situation to the point where God said, come back up yes, for another 40 days, and then you will receive the second tablets. Okay? 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul, 40 days from the start of the month of Elul, is the 10th of the month of Tishrei. 
the 10th of the month of Tishrei, a.k.a. also known as Yom Kippur. Kippur. That's the day that Moshe came down the second time with the second tablets, and those tablets were a message of Salachti, forgiveness, I forgive you. And Yom Kippur is established as the Yom of Slicha, the Kapara, the day of forgiveness. Clear? Mm -hmm. We good? Yeah. Don't forget, I, I want to talk to you guys afterwards about getting a, a card. Oh, that'd be great. Okay? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. Really All right? Good. So historically, Rosh Chodesh Elul is when Moshe reascended Mount Sinai for the second set of 40 days to receive the second Luchot. In order to mark those days, we will start to blow shofar every single morning. After shacharit, after morning prayers, we blow the shofar. This was, uh, this is partially, as you said, Ladaryl, to get us ready for Rosh Hashanah, the, the days of awe. But in addition to that, they had miscalculated the first 40 days. What was their miscalculation, according to most commentators? They thought that Moshe was supposed to come back and it was the 39th day so how were they off why why did why did they miscalculate they didn't count the day that he went up they did count they did yes. right they mistakenly counted the day that moshe ascended even though it, why should that day not have been counted because a jewish day is night and then day it's always getting brighter. It's always getting better. We go from darkness to light. So that day was not a complete day. It should not have been counted. They counted that as day one. Really, that was day zero. So their day 40 was actually day 39. When Moshe did not come down, they panicked. Golden calf. Moshe came down the next morning and... Uh, got things in order, <laughs> cleaned house a bit. Yeah. Okay. So on Rosh Chodesh Elul, we start a to blow the shofar daily in order to keep a good tally, in order to keep a good cheshbon, a good calculation. So that's one thing that starts Rosh Chodesh Elul. Another thing that starts Rosh Chodesh Elul is that we add a paragraph to, uh, am I getting this? Oh, sure. yeah. Please. Thank you. Thank you. We add a paragraph to our morning davening and to our evening davening after Shacharit and after Mincha. Minak Svard and after Marev. Minak Svard is they will add it after Shacharit and after Mincha. Thank you. That which we add is Ledavid Hashem. Ori ve Yishi, which is Psalm, I got it wrong, I said 36 this morning. It's Psalm 27. Okay? Le David, a song of David. Hashem Ori, God is my light, my illumination. That is a reference to Rosh Hashanah. Ve Yishi, and my salvation. That is a reference to Yom Kippur. Mimi Ira. From whom should I fear? Right? Retor asking rhetorically, right? That we don't fear anyone. We recognize Hashem is our light and our salvation. Hashem ma'oz chayai. Hashem is the, oh, let's see, let's, uh, my life's strength. Mimi efchad, from whom shall I uh, dread? Later on, we say in that. Tehillim, ki itzbeneni besuko. God uh, shields me in his sukkah. Okay? So we actually say the shofar blowing stops actually the day before Rosh Hashanah we already don't do in order to separate between our minhag, 
our custom blowing shofar, which we do the whole month of Elul, to our obligatory mitzvah blowing shofar, which we do on Rosh Hashanah. Well, the David Hashem Ori Yishi, that we take straight through Shmini Atzeret, not Simcha Torah. We take that straight through uh, Sukkot and um, no, not Shmini Atzeret. On Rosh Hashanah, we still will, because that's a suffix. We'll get to that when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that is the the coming events and the calendar. And they might even ask you guys that question on Thursday, actually. <laughs> right? They might ask, you know, what's coming up? Mm-hmm. Right? What's the significance, the historic significance? What is? They're probably not. They're not really going to be testing you guys at this point. They really not just yet, want to yeah, yeah. get get a sense of where you're at. But um, it's always, you know, my father, I love Hashem, bless him memory. So he would always say to me, whenever you're going anywhere for any sort of event, my father was a professor, so he was a, mm-hmm. he was a very good speaker. And he said what he does, what he urged me to do, especially when I was choosing the path of, the rabbinate, right? He said, even if it's not your gig, right? You're not running it. Someone else is, right? Always have something to say. Always have something to say. If they ask you to spontaneously say a few words, you come out like a gem, right? Wow, that was off the cuff, right? If they don't ask you, it was a good exercise and you'll have it for another time. Right? And that's what I'm saying over here. It's always good to have uh, to have it. That's great advice. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. My father, Lava Shalom, always had uh, excellent, excellent advice. Okay, let's let's carry through and Rabbi, finish. Rabbi, yeah. I have a question. Um, yes. Where do the 13 attributes um, come in into this picture of Elul and the uh, you know the giving of the or, or in the receiving of the second tablets what what is okay that's that's an excellent question leticia and the 13 attributes of god's mercy okay so let me add one other one other point the saturday night before rosh hashanah we start to say slichot slichot is forgivenesses special prayers of forgiveness okay you have to do it for we do it for a minimum of four days but we always start on sunday saturday night sundays when we start so this year where rosh hashanah falls out on a monday so we need to start not the saturday night right before rosh hashanah but going back a week before that the main part of the slichot is saying the 13 attributes of God's mercy. And we sing that. Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachon, Vechon, Erech, Apayim, Rav Chesed, V'yemet. And that makes up the main part of the Yom Kippur prayers. Okay? So we'll start that, in this case, uh, the sa- about nine days before Rosh Hashanah. We'll continue on the day, saying that on the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and again on Yom Kippur itself, we'll say that many times. And when Moshe was imploring God to forgive us for the sin of the golden calf, Hashem taught him these 13 attributes and instructed us to do them, right? Not just to say them, but to try to do them, right? That those attributes of mercy that we attribute to God, those also need need to be our attributes that we live and that we deal with others, right, with those attributes. So that's the Yud Gimel Midot, okay? Um, Another part of the curriculum that we will go through, and interesting, right? is the 13 principles of faith, right? We have in the Siddur, we haven't done that, right? 
we did we that started with that. very early on. We started with that. But it's always good to go over. It. Okay, no, no, but, but but I'd rather, yeah. if we started with that, good, we'll start, right? We started with that. I remember I remember exactly why we did that. Yes. Yep. All right. And um, yeah, okay. So 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 I think we'll move on to Kashrut um, after, after this. Let us continue on page 263 in our book, Miscellaneous Work 265, Writing and Drawing. Okay, it is prohibited to write on Shabbat. This includes drawing, painting, sketching, stamping, engraving on any material, even its sand, dust, vapor on windows, spilled liquids on a table. Okay, even right, some would be considered Doraita. What does Doraita mean? Torah prohibition. Others are considered to be De Rabbanan. Rabbanan, rabbinic, rabbinic, right? But either way, uh, we don't do any of the drawing, right, on Shabbat, right? That is clear creative activity. And again, Shabbat, God ceased from creating, from molding the creation to fit his will. On Shabbat, we don't create we don't mold the world to fit our needs using our power our technological prowess right you know people say hey maybe i can turn the light hey alexa turn on the light right is that okay on shabbos no. right clearly it's not okay on shabbos because that is using our power strength knowledge technological prowess to alter the world to our needs god stopped altering the world uh, on the shabbat and allowed it to be so too that is what we must do 266 erasing and breaking letters i feel we did this we do this yes maybe we just got started with just this okay we'll continue Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, actually, it was mentioned earlier, and then you yeah. found where, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. oh, yeah, because yeah. we kind of, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, <clears throat> erasing and breaking letters on food, erasing any kind of writings prohibited on Shabbos. If wax, grease, or a similar substance dripped on written letters, one may not scrape it off on Shabbat. Okay, not so so common that we would be doing a little more common. Oh. One may not break or cut, whether by hand or instrument, the edible letters and words on cakes or other foods. Okay? And that is the classic... Hmm. Okay, good. The Mishabrua, that's the Mishabrua is the Chafetz Chaim's commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, on the Code of Jewish Law. Right, there are four sections of code of Jewish law. One deals with predominantly marriage relationship uh, halachas. Another deals with with business laws, monetary laws. Another deals is a combination of many, which is kashrut and family purity. Right, and the other one, the one that we use the most, I would say, is orech chaim which is the path of life, which is our day-to-day. It's, it, it, it's prayers, it's Shabbos, it's holidays. And the Chafetz Chaim, the great sage, the Chafetz Chaim wrote his Sefer, his Magnus Opus Mishnah Brura, on that portion of Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish Law, and that is what we follow. This Brura, however, permits cutting of food onto which the letters were raised or pressed as long as the letters are not from another substance. In other words, that bowl of biscuits in the middle over there that says on it, matok, maze matok, sweet, sweet. right? Something that uh, you know, a person will endearingly call, ah, uh, matok shali, my, my sweetheart, matok shali. Okay, so that is okay. You have biscuits, or if you've got, 
I think Oreo cookies probably have the word Oreo written on them. I think do they, they have? do, yeah. Yeah, right. Thank God we can eat Oreo cookies on Shabbos. Okay, it's a very, very important halacha, right? That's a biggie. That's a biggie. All right. So something like that. Why? What's right? the Chazan Chaz Ish rule? Stringently, we follow the Chafetz Chaim. Okay. It's not written. Writing is taking one substance and applying it onto another substance. That is what writing is. What writing was done in the Beit HaMikdash? Good. The, the, the construction had these upright posts called the Karashim. And anyone who's built a sukkah and taken it down and try to put it up the next year, it's a lot easier if you know what goes where each time, right? Which ones? So they would have markings to make sure that the same one was always next. It was right. There were yeah. all together. 20, 40. There were 46 crushing all together. You want to make sure that they had, right, the ones that were in the corners were the same ones and everything was lined up in the same way. Okay. Cake is an issue, right? Birthday cakes are an issue. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, if you can cut between the letters, right, so you're not breaking any any letters, that is okay, right? Typically what most kosher bakeries do nowadays is they'll write, happy birthday, Susan, right, on a nice big piece of chocolate. And that chocolate can come off and then the cake can be cut. Mm. Okay. Okay. Pasting, molding, sculpting. Very good. That we can't do. Interesting. It's better to paste, sculpt, and mold with clay, play dough, or any other material. That's more for adults, my friends. <laughs> <than letting. laughs> that was coming. I, was I know what's coming. I know my customers. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know and love my customers. Okay, yes. So London can play with Play-Doh. All right. Mm -hmm. Let the children, let the children play. Mm -hmm. Let them enjoy Shabbos. You know, there are there are certain things that we wouldn't have them play with. Electronics, yeah. things like that. They're not going to play with. So when it comes to these sort of things, let the children play. What's kind of the age range where you'd want to start? Um, kind of making them more aware of those other malachos. It's different. I would say, yeah, I would say certainly not before six, seven, eight, nine, depending on the kid. Yeah. yeah. Right. And you see, you've got on either, on either side of that, you've got your almost adult children and you've got the, the little brood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sewing, tightening threads in woolen garments. Okay, it's prohibited to sew, tighten a loose thread, or open a seam. Okay, now that, that comes out. That, that is applicable. We're not going to start sewing on Shabbos, right? But if you have a new suit, men, and maybe women's suits also, are the, are the, are, by men's suit, the, the pockets are sewn shut, yeah. right? So you would not want to take that out. On Shabbos, I don't know if a woman's suits or not. I don't know. You said it's prohibited to not do a loose like string or thing. right. So if you got a loose, if you got a loose thing and you're going to basically tighten that, that's basically sewing. That's what you're doing over there, right? A string or thread inserted in a collar or sleeve may not be pulled tight if it is inserted in the cloth itself. It's remember sewing. Okay. This kind of tie is commonly found in knitted garments, baby clothing, and baby hats. I'm sorry, only the holes are wide enough. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tightening cords in a collar or a sleeve, you're wearing a hoodie, mm -hmm. right? You want to pull. You know, that's not a problem, That right? It's where it's where it's it's sewn into it and it's and, and it's coming out 
Cutting papers, pages, separating pages are stuck together. One may not cut material of paper or tear toilet paper off a roll. So what we do is we have a box of tissues. Actually, in, in Israel, they sell they sell packs of uh, near toilet le Shabbat, right? Toilet paper for Shabbat, which is already right <laughs> cut, right? So we just have we just have we just use boxes of tissues, mm-hmm. right? If we're traveling, we don't have a box of tissues there. You're at an Airbnb, whatever, right? So then, just before Shabbos, pre-tear, yeah. pre-tear yeah. right? Not a, you know, in general, right? You know, we pre-tear um, a bunch of paper towels before Shabbos. Mm-hmm. We have we have a, a stack of pre-torn uh, paper towels. That's one of one of my one of my, I'm, I'm very skilled in the kitchen. That's one of my <laughs> one of my jobs that I can be trusted with. Yeah, <laughs> not to remember to do it, but at least to do it properly, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we cut well aluminum foil. Right, so mm-hmm. we have we have a, a box of the pre-cut, but sometimes those sizes aren't the right size. Yeah, yeah. So we have a bunch of pre-cut aluminum foil that we keep in our drawer, right? And like we said, we have tissues, right? But otherwise, now if you are in a situation where one is in need of toilet paper and there is no torn toilet paper, right? So then. We have a concept called kavod habriot, kavod, honor, briot, people, right? Or we will call that human dignity. Okay, so then one would need to use toilet paper. Okay, yeah. one needs to use toilet paper, right? Uh, so you would try to tear it in an unusual manner, shinoi, right? You know, you know, not the way that one normally tears it, right? Or I don't know, maybe one could use some paper and then just, I don't know, be creative. I don't want to get too graphic over here, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, but cover habriot, right? Human dignity is also a, um, is a factor, mm-hmm. is a factor, okay. It is, per, it, is, it is a prohibition by Torah law, da'oraita or da'oraisa, either way to pronounce that, to separate the edges of pages that were not cut in books, journals, or newspapers. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, papers on it which, were, which were intentionally glued together may not be separated. Okay, so you buy a new book, you have a new safer, so even a new bencher, mm-hmm. right? And the pages are not have not been properly separated. That's a problem, right? What happens with our benches that, you know, we have a lot of sticky fingers, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and the page gets stuck it's stuck together somewhat. That's not an issue because they're not, that's not cutting. They're, they're stuck and you're un, mm. unstucking them, okay? <laughs> Unsticking them, right? But But if they're together like that, now, interesting. We didn't. He didn't mention it, but um, erasing letters, right? So let's say I write on my sitter. I write "sinner," mm-hmm. right? So now, when I open the C door, what happens? You're erasing. It. I just broke the letters apart. Mm-hmm. So best not to write on those books. Mm-hmm. Best not to use on Shabbos a book or a C door that has been written on. But if you need it, it's not really considered to be erasing or breaking. So it would be usable. Okay. Um, Rabbi, yes. So this is Doraita. Why is that so? Because is it because of the category that it's just cutting? Um, yeah. That's okay. It's not. It's not mentioned. It's a vote yeah. category, not a told vote. Correct. Um, well, no. Toldot are also, okay. So Gabriela mentioned the terms avot and toldot. Av, it literally means a father, a primary, and toldot are more derivatives. Toldot are literally like generations, okay? But they're all minha Torah. For example, classic example, right? Number two of the 39 malachot, 
Number one, well, actually maybe the first one, is planting. That's the Av. But what is the category of planting? Anything that is promoting the growth. So therefore, watering is a tolda of planting, but it is the oraita. It is Torah level. Okay? The difference gets a little bit um, a little bit technical. Meaning, if I do an av and it's tolda, then I would only be eligible for one repercussion. If I do two avs, I would be eligible for two repercussions. Okay, but that, that, that's more technical. Whereas the Rabbanan is something that it's not being done in the way that the Torah prohibited it, but it's close enough that the Rabbanan made what's called a Sayag the Torah. One of the first things mentioned in the of the Fathers is that you should make a fence around the Torah. And as we've often explained, if Southern California Edison is opening up the street in order to get to the cables underneath, if they're not going to put some sort of fencing around it, that's criminal because people are going to fall in and get hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea of a Sayag the Torah. If you have a Torah prohibition, so we don't want to go right up against it and stop right there, we step back and we stop one step further back. Okay, that would be the Rabbana. Okay. Okay, continuing 270, tying, untying a knot or a bow. Okay, it is prohibited to make a knot on Shabbos or to tie in a knot which became loose. Okay, we're talking about permanent knots. And this is likely to happen with the strings of one's talit, whether it's one's tzitzit, the talis kasan, the garment that we wear under, right? Or the talit that we wear uh, over when we're davening. They often become loose. And it's tempting as heck to tighten it, right? But we don't do that on Shabbos. Why not? Because that is a permanent knot. It is permitted to make a bow over a single knot, such as done as is done when tying shoes, only if one intends to open it on the same day that it was made. Okay? So shoelaces are not a problem. Okay? Right. Yeah. Are they, are they, but there's only a problem if you double knot it. Let's come to that. Okay. Good. Any knot that is permitted to make on Shabbos is also permitted to be opened. If the bow of a shoelace became a double knot, one is permitted to open the knot. I will take this a step further. And they wouldn't be able to write this in a book. Because I told you, you're writing a book, you have to make sure that no one could you know, could shoot at you. Hey, how can you allow that? Right? But if you have shoelaces like mine on my Shabbos shoes, that a single, a single bow comes out. Right? So then you can do a double knot. Okay? That's not, it's not a permanent knot. It's, 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 it's even that's going to come out by itself with the type of shoelaces that I have. Okay? And, right, the shoes are coming on and off. They go on, right? They're coming off Friday night. They come on Shabbos more, right? Shoes are going on and off. Okay? So are you ideally untying them every time you take them off then to make sure that it's a temporary knot? Um, I have to. I can't get my foot out uh, otherwise. Yeah. Well, yeah. Some people, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, okay, but but if a person has shoes with a shoe, look, some, there, there are certain slip-on shoes that that have a bow as more of a uh, you know a decorative bow, yeah. right? That even single bow should not be. Should not be uh, uh, should not be tied on Shabbos because that's a permanent knot. Yeah. That's not meant to be opened and closed. Mm -hmm. 
I'll tell you something else that someone else pointed out to me is interesting, right? You're taking out the garbage, okay? Taking out the garbage, right? Within an A river, within your own house, whatever, whatever the story is, right? So typically, right, what people often do, you have those drawstrings, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to tie a knot before you put it in, okay? So you're tying a double knot, that's definitely a problem. But I have news for you. Even a bow on Shabbos would be a problem. Why? A bow for the garbage bag? A bow on the garbage bag. We're not going to untie that. That's a permanent bow. That's a permanent knot. Right? So even though right, the halachic mind would, would, would initially think, oh, let me just tie a bow and everything's good. Right? So you don't. It's like the diapers on Shabbos. You don't retie them into the trash can. You just pick it up and toss it because then that's like permanently. Interesting. Fine. Okay. So I was going to ask that about because sometimes we'll put dirty ones into a grocery bag. Do you, so you couldn't do a one tie and then toss it. Correct. Right. And, and the bag, when you take a bag and do that one tie, that's really a good permanent knot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll take it a step further. If you've got some, um, sometimes if you have leftovers and you're putting into a bag into the fridge, you do a knot like that. Yeah. Right. When, if you want that food on Shabbos, tie tear, no, tear the bag. Oh. Don't untie the knot. Mm-hmm. Tear the bag. Gotcha. That you can do. Gotcha. But don't untie it. Right. Yeah. So, so Robert, when it comes to your, your your shoe that you have to double double tie, let's just say you can take your foot out without untying them. Mm-hmm. You you would have you would still may have to make sure that you untie that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you're going to be slipping on and off, then don't then don't tie it on shots. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. Okay reinserting a shoelace that has been pulled out, okay? A ribbon or string pulled out of a shoe on 271. It may be reinserted if it was in the garment before Shabbos. Easy to insert. The holes are wide, right? The end of the string is usually not knotted or sewn after it's been inserted. Okay. Okay, so this is another issue. What's happening over here is, right, there's an issue of making a kli on Shabbos, finishing a vessel, finishing a kli on Shabbos. So if the shoelaces go in and out easily, so then, right? But if it's one of these boots, right? Sometimes you have these boots, you know, women's boots, you know, that have like a thousand laces to get, you know, uh, up to their knee. Shaloha, son of Isha, make that blessing. A lot of kavana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Whenever, whenever we're getting ready for, uh, you know, getting ready, right? You know, and I, uh, we need to leave at, at at a quarter to six. I start getting dressing at, at five forty. Yeah. You know, I need about five minutes. You know, and <laughs> I think about that blessing. It's, it's <laughs> so easy for a man to get yeah. ready. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, so you know, if if we're talking about one of these things that gets stitched and stitched, about, you know, so, so that's that's how you make that clee that you don't want to do on Shabbos. If it's a shoelace of a regular shoe that can't, you know, that was a shoe in there and and, and it, it, it snapped, so you're gonna put another shoe. With normal shoes that will not be an issue. The issue over here would be if that's like making making the clee, right? And that, that's what the the father's doing in the diagram over there. Right, you know, those shoes are not usable until the first time that the laces are placed in, right? So that that's going to be the issue over there. Okay, let's continue on at a good pace over here. Let's do some more. Yeah, good. Chapter nine, caring for plants and animals. Okay. 275, climbing or making use of a tree. So we don't climb on trees on Shabbos. We don't make use of a tree on Shabbos. Okay. However, okay. A hammock could be used on Shabbos, even though it's hanging from the tree. It depends. If it's hanging from the tree itself, 
okay, then that is a problem. If it's hanging from something that is attached to the tree, okay, so the, here the hammock, have the straps that would hang on the tree and then it had like a, I think it's called a carabiner or a hook yeah. right and then that would hook onto the straps so the hammock itself never touched the tree it touched the straps so there were straps attached to the tree mm -hmm. and then there was the hammock would attach to the straps yeah, yeah the hammock so that would be fine yeah. yeah that would be fine yeah. and yes. I didn't hang it up on Shabbos. It was just Correct. already there. Correct. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The whole thing by the tree, guys, is a... Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> the whole thing about the tree is a rabbinic concern, lest you might come to tear or break something off of it, right? Which goes into the problem of, of harvesting. Okay. Okay, one may touch a tree, but don't, as long as it's a big tree, do not cause it to move. Okay. Cultivating the soil, okay, that we know. All forms, 277, plowing, working the land, right, spraying, picking, anything like that, right, that we know we can't do on Shabbos. Moving flower pots, watering flowers, okay. Okay, flower pots standing on the ground may not be moved from one place to another, or to take a flower pot on the ground and putting it on the ground. All these are issues, right? Our ground is, is considered to be like a continuation of the earth, so we don't want to do anything that's going to be in connection to the earth. Or you not put flowers and water on Shabbos, nor may one add or change the water in a vase containing flowers, okay? All of this is promoting growth, okay? Even though the, in, in, in a vase, it would probably be a, a rabbinic, right? Because it doesn't really cause it to grow, though. I'm not sure. Opening the flowers, opening, is that considered growth? I'm not sure. Uh, either way, we don't do it. I'm not sure if it's if it's the right or the rabbana. Gabriella? Um, I was going to ask, we have artificial plants at home, um, and I was thinking of the principle of Mars Ayin. I don't know if that's the correct principle, but just in the sense, like, by extension, you wouldn't touch artificial plants because they kind of look real. And, uh, um, that's interesting. So Gabriela asked, how about when you have artificial plants? Is that going to be an issue or not? Um, I would say probably not. Right, just because it's it's so common that people have artificial plants. Right, I would say probably not an issue. If it wasn't yeah. common, then would that? If be it wasn't common? common, you know, th th there's a halacha in Shulchan Aruch that if you have almond milk mm -hmm. being served at a meat meal, you have mm -hmm. to scatter some almonds next to the pitcher. Right? Because that way, people will know, oh, it's almond milk. Mm -hmm. And, right, I think I'm, not, I'm definitely the oldest guy here by a lot. <laughs> okay, so when they first came out with these non-dairy creamers, which was a big thing, right, probably in the 1960s, 1970s, when they first came out with it. So then any kosher caterer, when they would put out the non-dairy creamers, they would put it out in the, you know, it didn't look so so elegant. They put it out in the, they put the container on the table. Mm -hmm. So it'd be clear that this is not milk being served for your tea or coffee mm -hmm. after a meat meal. This is non-dairy creamer. Mm -hmm. Now we don't do that. Right? Now, right, it's unusual for people to drink. You drink cow's milk? Oh. I drink, oh, oh, I drink almonds. Oh, I drink cashew. Oh, I, you know? uh, who drinks cow's milk anymore? What are you, a baby calf? You know? You know, and, 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 and now, 
<laughs> you know, you, you go into you go into the supermarket. You know, they have like eighteen different imitation milks, and then and then they have like a little thing there over there for uh, for the cow's milk. Yeah, right. So so what I'm saying is these things change with time. Actually, I I I, I can't imagine doing this. But Shulchanar talks about drinking fish blood, right? Which would be allowed. Which would be allowed, right? Fish does not need to be slaughtered, mm-hmm. right? And there's there's no there's no halacha of removal of blood of the fish, but by uh, having some scales next to it, hopefully not in it, but having some scales next to it so that it's right again, right? You know, I, I mean, I, I never heard any drinking that, right? <laughs> but um, but these things change with time. Right, with the milk certainly changes with time, and I would say with the flowers also, people are, yeah. Rabbi, I did have a question about the watering. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes on days when Shabbos it's really hot when we're walking home, so I do have like a spray bottle sometimes. Is that something I shouldn't do on Shabbos? Would that be considered potentially watering, like to spray yeah. the kids, like with a little bit? No, that, that's that's not a problem. That would be a problem. Right. So you're afraid that you're spraying the kids, some of it might fall on some of Yeah. No, I wouldn't that wouldn't be an issue. Okay, fruit fell from a tree. Fruit which fell from a tree on Shabbos may not be moved or eaten on Shabbos. Why is that? Okay, but even if even if it's clear I didn't pick it. You're you're making making use of the tree? Um, the problem is going into Shabbos. Was that fruit usable going in? When did it? No. Right. No. If it fell, right. If it fell on Shabbos, right. That fruit was not usable going into Shabbos. That puts it into the category called muktza, mm-hmm. something that was that is set aside, right. Not designated for Shabbat use. Okay. If it is clear the fruits fell before Shabbos. Then they may be picked up and eaten one at a time. They may not be gathered, right? Because that's another issue of gathering fruit. Gathering fruit. Mm-hmm. Eating in the garden, walking on grass. Best not to eat in the garden, shall as a cause if water is served. It will almost inevitably be that it will, it will be spilled on the ground. You can walk on grass on Shabbos, even though what might happen? Right, you might take some dirt. You might tear out some grass. Why is that not a problem? Because you're not doing it intentionally. You're not doing it intentionally, and it's not a pesik ratio. It's not an automatic thing that will happen, right? If it's high grass or reeds or weeds, and you're running through them, then it almost is a pesik ratio. Again, pesik ratio is an automatic, albeit unintended, consequence. Right. So if it's going to happen automatically, unavoidably, then saying, well, I didn't I wasn't planning for it to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Doesn't doesn't doesn't, doesn't carry weight. Yeah. OK. Trapping, riding an animal, riding in a wagon, trapping animals not permitted on Shabbos. Right. This applies to animals commonly trapped, birds, wild animals, also those which are not such as insects. OK. Now, if you've got. Um, harmful animals, insects, bees, right? Think suk is time, mm-hmm. right? They they get attracted to the food. So then, what one might do is no. I just wanted. To, I don't want to spoil the table. Thank you. <laughs> right? You might trap it in a cup. Why is that okay? Combination of factors. First of all, it's not really that well trapped. Meaning, right, if you wanted to kill that and you got him in the cup, not so simple. Right. Right? So it's not really trapped as of yet. And B, if there's a possible danger, so then that will not be an issue. Okay? Mosquitoes, you know, unless we're talking about, you know, West Nile virus, something like that, right, that should not be, right? You know, right? Mosquitoes, as much as we don't enjoy them, Right, but you would not um, kill the mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. Once I tried to kill a spider, it wasn't Shabbat. 
Um, <laughs> a spider that I had trapped in a cup, and it is very difficult. And it was like a, it wasn't a transparent cup. It was like a red solo cup you can see. And like, I was so scared to peek inside to see, but it's very hard. So yeah, to your yeah. point. Look, what we'll, if it's something that, that could sting and hurt, what we'll do is we'll trap it. We'll slide something underneath. We'll go outside, put it down, take it off, and go back inside. Right? And that way, it gets to live, but doesn't get to eat us. Mm-hmm. That's the ants? That's the idea. Like, if there are little ants in your house, you can't, you can't mm-hmm. crush them. Mm-hmm. What's Frustrating as anything when you had that whole row of ants coming. Mm-hmm. So you can't do anything. And you're sitting there like, a whole row. Oh. But we just, like, our counter, they, they keep getting on our counter. It's a whole line of them. Can't do anything about that on Shabbos? We yeah. can't even use the ant bait, like stuff that's sitting there before Shabbos. If it's there before Shabbos, it's there before Shabbos. Okay. But we can't go and crack one open. And Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. That you could do. Oh, that you okay. can do. Cinnamon? Yeah. And then wow. it's animal kitchen. Cinnamon. Wow. Yeah, it, yeah, they, they give off a certain scent, and that's how they form that line. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or you might rather they stay in a nice organized line and have to Shabbos take care of it, as opposed to having them all scattered over the place, and then and then Shabbos ends, and then, well, that's your own personal preference. That's not Shabbos. Okay. Riding on a horse. Not permitted. Wagon pulled by an animal, not permitted. Um, even your animal must not work on the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Right? We don't we're not actually, you know, in, in such a position of, of farm animals doing work for us, right? But the Pasuk says that everything must um, must do its resting on Shabbos. Okay. We're going to leave the rest for next week mm-hmm. and hopefully finish up. I think there's only 13 chapters. Yeah, we should hopefully finish up next week. Mux is a bit complicated, but um, but within a week or two, we will be um, finished up that session. Awesome. Okay? Thank you. Good seeing everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks again, Gabriella, for the, for the goodies. Yeah, I'll take this. I'll take this. Yeah.